this movement is, is unstoppable. It's happening around the world. It is, there is a recognition of the power of and the need to educate girls and all of the things that it touches. Welcome to Uprising. Each episode looks inside what it takes to lead the most dynamic and successful cultural movements. Some of them in the business world, some in the social realm, some in politics, and some in between, to see why people start uprisings. What gives those initiatives momentum and keeps them going? And most important, what lessons can you learn from these movements and how to apply them to your business and even personal life? Let's explore the secret to sparking movements that move people into action. Passionate ideas. Controversial ideas. Uprising ideas. The power is now in the hands of anyone. To start a cultural movement. Your movement. To, to move, move the, the world. world. Today's Uprising Pod is brought to you by WarbyParker.com. Get a free five-day home try-on at www.WarbyParkerTrial.com slash uprising. Five pairs, five days, 100% free. Christina Lowry, welcome to the Uprising Podcast. Thank you so much. It's delightful to be here. We're very excited to have you on and talk about the Girl Rising Movement, which is a global movement for standing for girls' education and empowerment. I'm very fascinated today just to understand a few things about your movement that I'm sure our audience would love to know. And I think the first question I had is, you know, really, what is Girl Rising fighting for? We are fighting to fundamentally change the way girls are valued around the world. Now, in so many places, the value girls have is that of mothers-in-waiting, future sex partners, domestic workers. And we want people to see and to value girls for uh, more than that, <laughs> for their minds and for their incredible potential as human beings. Because we know that if girls are truly valued for those things, then investments will be made in them. Investments will be made in preparing them for the future. Policies will shift to better support girls in all aspects of their well-being, health, education, family planning, life skills, you name it. And so we believe that changing the way girls are valued will change the way societies treat their girls. And then the second thing that flows from that, of course, is that we are fighting for every girl around the world to have the chance to be educated and live a life of her choosing. So on a, I mean, the first time that I came into contact with this movement was a gentleman named Tahoor, who was an undersecretary general of the United Nations, made a speech in New York a few years ago, well, that was quite a number of years ago, when he talked about girl education and he said that it represented the most important thing that we as a society need to focus on because if you educate a girl child, you reduce overpopulation, you reduce terrorism, you reduce disease. I mean, there's a whole host of things that you can really make an impact on, which was a real eye-opener to me. Hey, you know, I mean, really, Scott, that was the real eye-opener for us, too, and why we ever set out to create the original film Girl Rising and to build a campaign around it that was really designed to um, spark and help fuel a movement. It was because the research is so compelling about what happens when you educate girls. Right? Educating girls is this incredibly powerful and positive driver of change um, and is in fact the single best investment to alleviate poverty. Right? Educated girls marry later, have fewer and healthier children, they can earn, for every year of secondary school, they can earn 20% more, thereby being able to contribute to their family's well-being better. They're more likely to participate in decision-making. There's a marked reduction in extremism and increased peace and security. And then, of course, educated girls go on to be educated mothers. And the research also shows that educated mothers are much more likely to make sure their children are then educated both boys and girls. And thus you have this virtuous cycle, right, of increased health, prosperity, education, stability, peace, 
you name it. It it is quite astounding. We have that same jaw-dropping moment, which is what made us create this whole project to begin with. Well, New York Times called you guys one of the hottest causes in recent years. And when I started looking into the Grow Rising model, I found it fascinating. Do you want to, could you talk to us a little bit about what your model is? Those of us that that created Grow Rising um, came from a background of journalism and filmmaking, primarily. And we knew the power of film to change the way people think and change the way people act. So we decided to create a project in which we would use high quality, compelling film and partnerships to scale the distribution of that film. And we've honed our model actually over the last couple of years. And as we have begun working in various countries around the world, to have three main pillars using the the heart and soul is high quality storytelling, which is primarily in the form of film, but also we've, we've, um, we've expanded and use radio in some places also. And we use film across these three different pillars. One is mass media. I'll give you an example of what we're doing in India. We took the original Girl Rising film that tells nine stories of nine girls from nine different countries, which was originally made in English. Uh, Each of those chapters was written by an acclaimed female writer from that country and then was voiced by a global superstar. We were lucky enough to get on board um, Meryl Streep and Anne Hathaway and Liam Neeson. And they are the voice of that original English language, Girl Rising. And when we went to India, for example, we remade that original film in Hindi with 10 Bollywood stars. And we put it on a television channel that has one of the biggest reaches across India. They reach some over 400 million households. And the the goal of that mass media component of what we do was really to raise the level of public dialogue about this issue, to introduce an idea and in some places, you know, a kind of a new social norm and get it talked about. So to have some of the biggest and most beloved stars in the country talking about on video, in public service announcements, tweeting, on their social media pages to all their vast number of followers talking about this issue, have it on television, have press and PR and social media around it. That component of our work was really more of a sort of umbrella media coverage. It's a it, it's an expanded advertising campaign in some ways, if you would, to get people talking about the positive benefits of educating girls. And then a second component, critically for us, is working through partners and turning these media tools into useful on-the-ground tools uh, for the likes of schools, teachers, nonprofits. Um, we work in India with uh, Save the Children, who built an entire community program in 40 villages around these Hindi language materials that we created. So in sort of one instance, we have the broad public being exposed to these messages through traditional and new evolving digital media. And then For certain target audiences, we're able to, through our partners, expose them and engage them in the topic over a sustained period of time in a deeper way. Hmm. And as a sort of related piece to both of those, we have, we, we have in all the places where we're working, we create the possibility for people to have screenings, whoever might want to, companies, schools, nonprofits, just individuals in their home be able to gather their own communities together and have a screening, have something to convene around, to watch that's compelling and moving and emotional, and then to give them ways to take action. And then the very last piece of our model is influencer engagement. And that has looked different country by country where we're working. The three main countries we're working in right now are India, Nigeria, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, as well as the US. But that influencer engagement has ranged from beloved celebrities um, that people look up to and that have a massive reach themselves when they uh, send out a tweet, 
to sports stars that people look up to, government officials, corporate leaders, you know, people of influence in, uh, in a society. So all of those together, it's sort of all of those pieces together that are really f- building and fueling, sparking and fueling this movement. I mean, it's fascinating I and mean, an extraordinary success you've had. I mean, most recently you had the First Lady, Michelle Obama, launch the high, highly visible 62 million girls campaign. Uh, I think you had other celebrities, Freda Pinto, who was Indian actress, Meryl Streep, you had Andra Day. I mean, a lot of people listening, obviously, you know, look at that and say that is an incredible success, which it is. How do you begin to get such um, well-known people to authorities and, and influencers and celebrities to join a cause in your movement? You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. At the very beginning, when we first set out to make this project, I can't tell you how many people sort of laughed us out of the room. Like, you want to do what? <laughs> you want to make a film? It's like the classics, you know. Yeah. Like feature film that people were going to want to go see in a movie theater mm. about girls' education and what you think you're going to get people like Meryl Streep and and Hathaway and Alicia Keys to be involved. You guys must be crazy. It's amazing. And, you know, we, as we made this project, we felt very strongly about each piece of it. And we knew we weren't going to cut corners in making the film. And I think that the quality of the project and the film that we wound up with and critically the buy-in and connections we had to some of the best in class organizations that are working in girls education was critical to our success. You know, often I think, especially in film at least, you know, there's so many worthy, important social cause films made all the time. And um, as filmmakers, we knew the life cycle of documentary film all too well to know that if we just went with the kind of traditional, all right, we're going to put our heads down, make this film that we really believe in, and then try to get people on board to help distribute it and get somebody to, to put it in an art house run for however many weeks and, and cross our fingers that people would go see it. We, we decided early on from the very time that we were in doing pre-production for the film and planning our very first trips to these nine countries that we went to, we were also talking at length to nonprofits who are experts in girls' education, who have been working on this for decades. You know, the, the girls' education has become a very sort of hot topic in the last five years. Hmm. But there are many people who have devoted their lives to this, of course, and know deeply what it's like on the ground. And we very much at the very beginning decided that we wanted to be of service to the movement and of service to those organizations that were that are working um, every day with girls all around the world. And so we they helped us in in being able to access and meet different girls all around the world. But we really in the end wanted to also be able to have this project serve them. So I think, you know, being careful about that strategy and also being super dedicated to making the highest quality product, the highest quality film we could, ended up in the end opening the doors that we needed open. And then it becomes kind of a snowball uh, Mm -hmm. once you have one uh, incredible public influencer, it's easier to get to the next. So, you know, we sort of grew from there. And so who was the first person who embraced you? That's so the first person, and when we were trying to select the voices for the film, we said, you know, we, we have to get the best first, because uh, mm. that's the only way we're going to get everybody else. And right. so we were able, Meryl Streep 
agreed uh, to voice the Ethiopia chapter. Wow. And um, out of that, we then asked uh, everybody else from, you know, slowly over time. Um, but we were very clear that we had to go with what we thought was the best first to help us open doors from from then on. And I'll say, you know, we also, some of it has just been in, incredible connections and also amazing strokes of luck. When we went into India, one of our original wonderful ambassadors and champions is Frida Pinto. Yep. Um, Frida, who voiced a piece of the original film, was able to help us get a meeting with the prime minister. So we met with Prime Minister Modi. And that, of course, unlocked certain doors for us in India that have been incredible. We have a major partnership with the with the Ministry of Women and Child Development, in which we have made a set of public service announcements and the Indian government has invested their own resources to put those across thousands of movie theaters and television channels. So when people, you know, went to see Star Wars or whatever in their local theater, they watched this public service announcement of 10 Bollywood stars talking about the, the benefits of educating girls. Mm. So, you know, you really have to sort of follow the each influencer can really open up a whole bunch of different doors. And it's really been a very organic, luckily, process for us. That's fascinating. So in the age of Trump, I mean, obviously things have changed. Maybe they haven't. On the one hand, you have a, a new mindset here leading the United States. At the same time, you have three very powerful women dominating European politics. You have this, you know, the Prime Minister of England as a woman. You have the Prime Minister of Germany as a woman. You have the one of two challenges for the French presidency as a woman. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting time to be a woman in the world today. But at the same time, you know, there's challenges in the United States with how women have been described, obviously, in the media by certain individuals. I won't get into names. Uh, but in that world, like, do you find that you've had to change your message a little bit? Or how, how have you dealt with, you know, the changing tides in, in the United States? It's an interesting question. You know, there's a, on a, on a very practical front, Something that is true uh, with this administration is that the investment in development programs is drastically reduced, right? The funding for USAID and the State Department, both of which have had robust programs, girls' education, gender, all kinds of different programs that benefit girls, um, has been drastically reduced. And as a practical matter, we ha have had one of those grants that uh, we were very hopeful would be extended uh, over the next two, two years, but have just very recently learned that it's not going to be extended because of the budget cuts. That's extraordinary. So I mean, it must make you ex incredibly angry and furious that you know, here in 2017, you have this amazing movement that you've started and built and literally had First Lady of the United States participate in like only a couple of months ago. And then all of a sudden everything's cut. I mean, it's unbelievable. It is frustrating. My hope is that this is just a, a minor little, uh, a, mi a minor little hurdle for us, because I do think, you know, the, as I see it, there is increased even with decreased funding to USAID and the State Department, around the world, there is increased funding for girls and girls' education, and it, and it continues to increase. So I find hope uh, in that fact. The other thing I would say, one of the things that's been interesting for us really since last fall is there's been a, a, a sort of palpable increase, renewed, I would say, interest in our U.S. educator materials. Wow. So one of the things when, when the original film Girl Rising came out, we created a curriculum that's from upper primary through secondary. It's mapped to the common core. So teachers can use it to teach all manner of things, to teach geography and social studies and history. And it's also being used in many settings, both in school and out of school, to help students understand, be introduced to what it means to be a global citizen, to explore ideas of courage, of perseverance. And we have had an increased interest from teachers in those materials really since last fall. And I think it's because 
many teachers are looking for new and engaging ways because of the climate that we're in, because of this political climate, of engaging their students in understanding the world outside our borders, experiencing empathy for people who live drastically different lives than they do, and to feel what it, and explore the idea of being an active global citizen and what it is to have kind of personal agency and, uh, and what an individual can do to be a change maker. So that's been interesting too. I mean, it's interesting that the defiance movement, you know, against the administration started right from the start as a, almost like a new feminist movement. You know, it's almost like the roots of a, a, a new, let's say, Girl Rising 2.0 is happening as a direct result of this new administration. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I mean, we, um, because so much of our work uh, is focused outside of the U.S. and getting girls uh, who have very little opportunity to be in school or stay in school um, to have the opportunity. Some of the kind of changing of tides here doesn't affect us that much. And we are a decidedly not political organization. And so, you know, I, I guess for me personally, uh, and I think for many of my team, I feel very pleased that I have something that that is, in fact, feels important and positive to dig into, uh, despite some of the challenges uh, that are right here underneath our nose in the U.S. For you, the listeners of Scott Goodson's Uprising Pod, Warby Parker is offering a free five-day home try-on to give you the opportunity to check out their glasses. To get your home try-on today, go to warbyparkertrial.com slash uprising. Again, that's warbyparkertrial.com slash uprising for your free five-day home try-on. One of the things that you have been amazing at uh, from the start is aligning yourself with large organizations who've been sponsors of your movement. Um, Moving forward, what types of organizations do you want to build relationships with that can help you accelerate your movement, grow your movement, extend it to other markets? Are there types of companies, are there types of organizations that you think are better for you than others? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's a very timely one as we are kind of at a transition point ourselves and thinking about our partners and our kind of first phase of who we as Girl Rising were and and why they were our partners and who our partners will be going forward. One of, you know, one answer is it will it will very much depend geographically, of course, where we are. We need to think about the organizations in the places where we are working. And right now, as I said, we are working in India, northern Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But we're also um, launching moving into the Middle East and to Latin America. Um, So we will consistently align ourselves with organizations that um, are seen as best in class uh, when it comes to girls' education and empowerment. But I think the lines between now what companies do in terms of their um, corporate investment in social good and uh, what nonprofits do and what media companies do, it's all becoming blurry. And so we are really looking for, in terms of, we believe wholeheartedly that companies need to be deeply invested in the idea of equality for girls and women. And so we are looking for companies that that believe that and that are eager to make a difference in that arena. And also, of course, companies that and organizations that that believe in and see the value of using media to change mindsets um, and attitudes. Right. One of the things that's a little tricky sometimes in this world from funders and from corporate partners is the desire for hard and fast and quick results and numbers metrics. And in education, that is a little bit harder than counting, say, the number of mosquito nets distributed or vaccines given. 
education and certainly changing mindsets is a longer term game. And so we are really looking for partners that understand that and that are ready to be in it for the long term also. It's an interesting conundrum because I think, you know, if you get into an argument about the economics of, for example, let's say something like the Olympic Games, and, you know, you can have, you can have a debate with an economist that will tell you investing in the Olympic Games is absolutely a horrible decision for any city because it's going to cost, you know, gazillions of dollars and so forth. But at some point, I wonder when the financial discussion needs to be put aside and discussions around values have to be put front and center. And, and it seems to me that, you know, if you focus on the econometrics of, of this type of a movement, of course, there are ways of demonstrating that it has an impact. But the reality is that, you know, it stands for a better world. It stands for a world where, you know, a lot of the things we talked about, you know, earlier can be solved. And, uh, and that's good for big companies, right? Like the more big companies improve the quality of life for their customers, the more stuff they sell. You know, they have a, actually an interest to actually educate girl children because they would consume more expensive products and, right. and so forth. So, you know, it seems to me that companies out there, even in the United States, like I know you're active in, internationally, but even in the United States, you know, companies that stand for girl rising values, that stand for helping bring more engineers into, female engineers into the world and help to create a system and a structure for women to be able to not only be educated, but continue to be adding value to society once they become mothers. You right. know, I mean, we don't have to look so far. We can see uh, countries like Sweden or Canada where women can continue in professional positions once they are mothers, they, the structure is in place. So there's still room to grow even in the United States. And I think Girl Rising as an idea is such a big idea, such a massive impact that it can play in so many areas, uh, obviously education, but in, in, in so many areas, I think that I'm sure there must be companies out there that recognize the power and importance of what you represent. Well, I think that's right. And, and, and there are some, I think big companies are um, in many ways also, you know, riding the waves of change of uh, what's happening here, of figuring out how as a company, what their agenda is. I think that some companies kind of go very granular into the kinds of things that they want to support as opposed to trying to zoom out to 30,000 feet and, and, and sort of get that, that framework that you just laid out, which of course, of course makes so much sense, right? Of course, if you get more, uh, if you get more girls who are educated and you get families who are more prosperous and have more disposable income, then they're going to buy more stuff. Right. But I think that also, you know, the other piece that I certainly hope and that we talk a lot about is, you know, there is the economic case and then there's just the like moral case, I think, right? Like what happens to other people in this world affects us, whether we right. choose to pay attention to it or not. Absolutely. And it's, very, and it's very easy to not pay attention to it, right? It's very easy to like just keep your walls up and make sure that you're, little, that you're okay in your little circle. But all of these things, money, war, natural disasters, disease outbreaks, climate change, literacy, education, right? They're all factors that have these wide sweeping influences that connect us to each other and more and more with every passing year, as we know. So whether you live in a small town in Texas, in New York City, in a village in India, in a bustling city in Nigeria, what happens to our fellow citizens on this earth shapes all of us. And we have to, we have a moral responsibility and a practical, uh, there's a very practical reason to pay attention to that and to care. I think if a Martian came to Earth, people would be unified for once, you know. Until that time, we're sort of living on these islands and building walls, or at least trying to. Why, Christina, why are you personally committed to this movement? What, what, what happened in your life or what got you to a point where you said, this is something that I care deeply and passionate about. I really want to see this thing take off. 
So there are a couple things. When I was, I was, I was about 15 years old when I first traveled to the developing world. I convinced my parents to let me go volunteer at an orphanage in Honduras. And it was really the first time that I experienced and was bowled over by the idea that I was sort of accidentally born where I was born, right? I had nothing to do with my great fortune. I had nothing to do with the benefits and, and, and the life that I had. And But for a stroke of luck, I could have been one of those children in an orphanage in Honduras. And that experience really stayed with me. And I was always really interested in issues of development. And at the same time, I had this other uh, burning passion that I loved, which I learned when I was in the fourth grade. In the fourth grade, I went to an all girls school. And every year, the fourth grade did a Shakespeare play. And we did Macbeth. And I got wow. cast as Macbeth as a fourth grader. And it really turned me on to the power of stories and engaging audiences. And so all through my high school and then college and graduate work, kind of I, I ping ponged back and forth between development and the desire to make the world a better place and storytelling. And it wasn't until after I was out of college that I found documentary film. Um, but when I did, I was truly blown away by the process. I loved the process of making documentary films and by the possibility of reaching so many people with a message. And then more recently, you know, I, I have been part of Girl Rising from the very beginning. Um, I took over as the CEO last year. And one of the reasons that I did is I looked at my then seven-year-old daughter and I thought, you know, if I were a mother somewhere in the world and wanted so desperately for my daughter to have choices, to just have the choice, perhaps to not be married at age 14, I would hope that somebody, that anybody, that, that everybody actually that had any chance of trying to change this for her would do it if I had no possibility to do it. And I just, in thinking about her, I thought, you know, this to me is one of the most important human rights issues of our time, girls equality. And to get to work on that issue with this other, in the way that we do at Girl Rising, using media is for me really just a dream come true. Girl Risings, an extraordinary movement that is really brought to life in documentary films, in uh, events, and through tools and actions that bring visibility to the issues girls face, inspire people to break down the barriers that hold them back. You have governments, you have NGOs, the world's most respected celebrities, obviously corporations and schools that are using the content that are engaging with the ideas that you're spreading to drive home your message for change for girls. It's really quite extraordinary. How, if, you know, for people listening to the Uprising show today, how can they join your movement? How can they participate in your movement? Where can they find you? Well, they can find us on the web, girlrising.com. And a, a, a great first step is to watch the original Girl Rising film and to get people, you know, to get their communities together we still see, you know, the film, the original film came out now over three years ago. But uh, for people who have not seen it, it is an incredibly powerful, it has this evergreen quality to it with these powerful, personal stories of these girls around the world. So one thing I would say is go to the website. Uh, you can find, you can watch the film from there. You can um, purchase it and download it. And there are many ways to take action join our list. We'll, we give people ways to take action. And the other thing I would say is that girls, this kind of bigger movement of girls equality and girls empowerment is you know, thankfully bigger than Girl Rising. <laughs> and so I also always tell people, once you start caring about this issue and wanting to dig in, 
dig in in ways that make sense for you, right? There are, there are, um, we have wonderful partners in other organizations that are doing great work from um, the Malala Fund to Girl Up to Girls Not Brides. And so there are many wonderful organizations that are doing great things. And I say to people, you know, find something that really you are passionate about. It could be a Big Brothers Big Sisters Club in your local community. Or it could be that what really lights somebody up is trying to engage and make uh, a difference in a school in Kenya. But whatever it is, get together with some friends and with people and commit to doing something. Hmm. That's great. That's great advice. And can people find inspiration on your site? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have all of the material that we, for for the films that we have, we have um, engagement guides, take action guides. We also have, uh, for people that are interested, we, I mentioned it earlier in the show, we have a curriculum that can be, that's free for educators to use and chapters of the film that go along with that for free. So if you're interested uh, in taking it to your local school district or if you're a student or a teacher, that's available on our site. We have a new young adult book that just came out that's published by Random House Children's Book called Girl Rising, um, which is a really... It goes into more more depth of some of the stories that are in the film and many, many. We met hundreds of incredible girls all around the world. Um, and the book goes into some of their life stories a little bit more into some of these issues a little more deeply than one can do in the film. So th- there's a book that, to be bought if you want to uh, snuggle up on the couch and, and, and dive in that way as well. Girl Rising extraordinary, genuinely extraordinary movement about how the education of girl children can make a significant difference on a, on a global basis on, in so many areas. The movement is really extraordinary. So much that you've done in such a short time, and it's such a compelling issue. I'm sure that people listening to this will go and check out your website and want to be you know, part of this movement. What's next for you for Girl Rising? What's next is we are expanding, as I mentioned earlier, to two new regions in the next couple of years, to the Middle East and to Latin America. And so we're looking to tell new stories, create new films in those places and uh, and run campaigns. And we also are looking to make some brand new films. We're developing some new film projects that look very different than the Girl Rising film, um, considering everything from an animated feature to other documentaries. Uh, We are really continue to be committed to using film and media to change the way people think about and value girls. So all of those things, we are expanding in India, expanding our U.S. educator work, and what will really, what will take a lot of our time and energy over the next couple of years is launching in these new in these new regions. We really believe at Girl Rising that there's an incredible opportunity to take these campaigns country by country, region by region around the world, and to continue to help spark and fuel a movement that unites all kinds of different people, actors, organizations, companies, governments under uh, this unifying principle that educating girls is good for all of us and requires all of us. Christina Lowry, this has been a really great discussion. I've really appreciated your time to hear about, you know, your big idea, to hear about your model, which is really fascinating because it's not just about the idea, but how you actually bring it to the ground and get people to engage and action it and your success and the challenges you faced. Really, really inspiring. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining our uprising today and listening to our show. If you missed the show or if you want to find out more about who was on or if you want to learn more about how to create your own uprising, please go to uprisingmovements.com. You can also download this uprising program from iTunes. Uprising was produced by Nicola Keneally and Adam Helen with special help from Melanie Boardman, Karen Drakenberg, Philippa Freeman, Brianna Campbell, Fashad Faroudi, Mark Bruzzi, Will Issam, James Politi, and Jonathan Weeks. My name is Scott Goodson, and you've been listening to Uprising. What we can learn about movements and uprisings that are shaping our world in business, in society, and in between. 
For more on cultural movements and movement marketing, be sure to pick up a copy of the best-selling book, Uprising, How to Build a Brand and Change the World by Sparking Cultural Movements, available on Amazon.com. Music for Uprising, composed by Charles Duchateau, 